Thank you, Bob. Uh, again, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real honor. And today I'll be talking about the rail technique, a surgical, surgical technique and description. Um, this is something that uh, variation Dr. Gupta taught me when I was a fellow and I've modified it and it's something that I use very, very routinely. So by way of background, uh, three column osteotomies in the thoracic spine are powerful corrective techniques that are often necessary to address severe kyphotic and Crohn deformities from a variety of pathologies, uh, junctional failures, either proximal or distal, infections and tumors I think would fall into this category, and then scoliosis. And the scoliosis world is, is vast uh, from idiopathic uh, neglected deformities to congenital and neuromusculars. Now, thoracic three-column osteotomies can be performed through a very um, predictable stepwise approach. Everyone has some modification to it, but there are five major steps that I think are important to understand. I call it the 101 uh, of thoracic three-column osteotomies. The first is to place screws at least three levels above, three levels below the planned VCR site. Um, patients with poor bone quality um, definitely would consider going more. Um, cranial or cauda with your fixation. The second is to provide stabilization um, while you are performing your decompression. Um, so you pr place provisional stabilization either unilaterally or bilaterally. That then proceeds with placing, uh, performing a posterior decompression. You then perform the corpectomy of the VCR, and then you get to the, the fun part, which are the corrective techniques. Uh, and these, a lot of times, are uh, centered around uh, shortening the posterior column. But if you really want to correct uh, severe deformities, it's important to lengthen the anterior column. That was discussed in the lab this morning with taking the ALL. And you can do this both um, you know, symmetrically or asymmetrically, depending on the deformity. The standard shortening techniques are shown here. You have segmental compression on the left and then cantilever bending, uh, which are very powerful techniques. The challenges with this, especially in patients who are elderly, poor bone quality, is that they place considerable stress um, to the individual screws. Um, because everything's happening on a segmental basis. Um, screw pullout, as you see on the right, is a considerable concern, especially with cantilever bending. And uh, segmental compression can result in screw plow. And this will jeopardize your deformity correction. If you don't have good fixation, um, you will not be able to achieve the correction that you're looking for. So it really brings us to the question of, is there a safer alternative? And the answer is yes. Um, it's this technique um, that Dr. Gupta taught me, the rail technique. And the way I've um, conceptualized this is it really comes from a concept in orthopedic trauma where you're compressing across a fracture. So you're placing screws on one side of the fracture. You're then placing a screw asymmetrically through the plate, and that then creates this unblock um, compression of one side of the, the bone to the other. Um, we wrote a case report of a case that we did in fellowship together, um, and since then I've modified it, and we just put out um, this paper. It's a video surgical technique on using the rail technique for uh, proximal junctional kyphosis through a VCR. Um, and I'd like to walk through the surgical technique with you guys. So um, after you expose, you place screws above and below. Uh, the patient has a prior surgery, say um, it's a distal junctional failure. You don't need, necessarily need to expose everything. Um, that's one of the benefits of this technique is that you're gonna uh, connect into prior instrumentation um, or if it's a proximal extension of a, of, of a construct. Then it really gets to the point where you're setting up for the rail technique, where you place short rods above and below the planned osteotomy site. Um, this is then followed by placing W connectors, um, I would say at least four above, four below. Try to get it as close to the VC VCR site as possible. Um, this is then followed by cutting, contouring, and then placing your accessory rods between those W connectors laterally. You can do this unilaterally or bilaterally, um, but I definitely say this should be done unilaterally. This again is your provisional stabilization um, when you're performing your decompression. And as we'll show in the next several slides, the workhorse for your deformity correction. Everything's gonna be done along this lateral accessory rod. So then you perform the VCR, and then you perform your deformity correction via segmental compression and cantilever bending through this accessory rail. Um, 
walk through how this is done. So starting with um, tightening all the screws on the main rods on both sides of the three column osteotomy, which is the blue square. Then on one side of the three column osteotomy, you want to tighten the set screws on the accessory rod. You leave the set screws on the accessory rod on the contralateral side um, free and open, and that's where they're going to slide when you do your segmental compression. You then place a rod holder um, through on the accessory rod, then you compress, and what this allows is this whole segment is going to shorten, unblock, um, and shorten across the VCR site. So there's no uh, stress that goes across the individual screws. You won't have any screw pull out because the entire segment is moving together. This was a patient of mine, patient with multiple myeloma. I had done a front back uh, cervical operation on a three level corpectomy and then a C2 to T2. And she failed distally because of very poor bone quality. And so we extended her down to L1, L2, um, and used the rail technique um, to um, shorten her and correct the deformity in the upper thoracic spine. Now, the nice thing about this is we didn't have to take out all the old instrumentation. All we did is we uh, cut the rod between T1 and T2, took out the T2 screw, put new screws distal, and then used our rod technique to perform our uh, correction. So this is the segmental compression. We're loosening those distal set screws. Everything cranial is locked. And I put a rod holder on the accessory rod. And then it's, it's, it's subtle. Um, it's not going to be very uh, profound in terms of how much it shortens. But the correction is very, very powerful. So again, compressing there, the whole head is now uh, shortening through the three column osteotomy site. Um, the other way that you can correct kyphotic deformities is through cantilever bending. Uh, in, in this situation, you're going to secure the rod that's under contoured uh, on one side, the rail, and then you're going to push down and uh, that will shorten through the three column osteotomy side again. So same patient and here, you can see here the under contoured rod, it's the accessory rod bringing it down into the W connectors, which is then secured. Another nice thing about this technique is that, say a patient has um, physiologic trouble during the operation, say they code. At this time, all your instrumentation is already in. You don't have to struggle to put in a long rod from the lumbar spine all the way to C2. Um, everything has been broken up into small pieces, and uh, it's much more manageable, especially on sick patients. Um, so this is the, the correction. So as stated, uh, the advantage of the rail to get con controlled compression across a three-column osteo osteotomy site, it minimizes translation. Given that you have multiple fixation points above and below the osteotomy site, you can perform asymmetric compression across a three across the three-column osteotomy, which can help correct both sagittal and coronal deformities. Um, again, it minimizes bone screw uh, interface forces, no direct compression across any of the individual screws, and then you can slide along those rails um, so it's transferred, all the stresses are transferred. And then again, the temporary rods ultimately act as your final rods. So a couple more case examples where I think this was uh, beneficial. Uh, patient, very, very sick woman, end-stage renal disease, terrible bone quality. She had about five cervical spine surgeries, uh, multi-level anterior, C1, now down to C, uh, T4. Um, you can see she already had a distal junctional failure. Um, they placed domino connectors there, went from T2 to T4, and had another failure distally. Also has a concomitant uh, coronal deformity. So in this case, we ended up uh, performing a T4 VCR using the rail technique. Again, didn't take out any of the instrumentation cranially other than taking off the dominoes, um, putting new screws distally, and then correcting both sagittally as well as coronally through the three-column osteotomy. Um, this is a lady of mine from several years ago, um, young woman, 25 years old, who had a congenital kyphoscoliosis, um, about 100 degrees in both planes, very uh, unhappy with her figure as well as uh, considerable back pain, and is a ne neglected uh, deformity from uh, another country. And you can see here has this uh, essentially block hemivertebra from T8 down to L1, and we 
uh, we're able to do this through um, the rail technique. Um, you can see here that uh, placing a stabilizing rod all the way from L4 to T3 um, would have been quite challenging. So in this case, we broke it up into those individual steps. Cranial small rod above the VCR, below the VCR, and then that rod. And then with a variety, uh, multiple rod exchanges with cantilever bending as well as shortening, um, we were able to correct her, I think, um, acceptably in the coronal plane as well as uh, the sagittal plane. She's a bit three years out from surgery and, and doing quite well. Um, this is a more recent case of mine, uh, congenital kyphoscoliosis. Um, had an insight to fusion of T3 to T5 in Mexico and um, had a, essentially a chin on chest deformity. Was having a lot of trouble breathing, very restrictive lung disease. Um, you can see here I had a 135 degree uh, kypho, kyphosis um, and about similar in the uh, coronal plane. Um, you can see here uh, the uh, 3D modeling of her spine, the uh, fusion, attempted in situ fusion, as well as the degree of her deformity. Um, very, very small girl. And you can see here the uh, prominence over her upper thoracic spine. So again, we broke this up into steps using the rail technique. Uh, went from C2 down to T10, placed instrumentation in the proximal, uh, proximally cervical spine and, and distally. Um, you can see here that uh, that accessory rod, the rail, is for the temporary stabilization, and you can we're working underneath it to remove the the vertebral body. Uh, I may try out the bone scalpel for these uh, on the next couple ones, um, and. Uh, we, we lost motors during the decompression, but um, by the time that we were able to shorten her and correct her, um, everything returned back to baseline. So coronally, I think we straightened her out quite nicely, and then uh, sadly, uh, we improved it to about 50 degrees. So she's had a kind of a rocky course just with her respiratory status, but overall is doing quite well. Um, the last case I wanted to show you using the rail technique is this lady, um, young girl, 19 years old, um, came from Europe, was a, um, funded by the Scoliosis Research Society to have surgery at UCSF. One of my partners asked me to take this on. You can see here she had 30 prior surgeries, um, had a prior spinal cord injury, um, multiple infections, all the rods and screws were taken out and had a progressive deformity um, with uh, 100 degrees both in the coronal and sagittal plane. Um, this is her, you can see the um, midline incision, but also had that uh, anterior thoracotomy to attempted fusion. Um, you can also see here that she has the ulcerations over her rib hump, and that was really causing her the most trouble. Um, the CT scan 3D showed a fusion um, from T4 down to L3, but had a um, non-union through the apical segment. Uh, this is her on the table, and you can see here those ulcerations of the thoracic spine, uh, of the, the ribs. And um, in order to actually expose the rib prominence, we had to tee and connect the thoracotomy to the midline incision to fillet open and, and be able to access, uh, take out the ribs, but also access the anterior vertebral body. So this was her on the table. Again, preparing for the, rod, uh, the rail technique, placing screws proximally and distally, uh, connecting those small rods, cranial and caudal, placing our temporary rod, um, this is looking at it from the side, almost uh, in plane with the deformity. And then that was then followed by the decompression and then the VCR, and then through a variety of cantilever maneuvers through the rail, shortening, et cetera. Um, we were able to get her perfect, but I think um, in a better place. So she was quite happy and is doing extremely well. So in conclusion, the rail technique is a safe and efficacious method to correct severe thoracic angular deformities, both in the sagittal and coronal plane across the three-column osteotomy. Um, again, it provides unblocked shortening along the accessory rods, allows asymmetric compression, minimizes bone screw interface forces, no direct compression across any individual screws. Temporary rods can act as your final rods. and. I don't want you, this to be your only technique. I just uh, hope that it will be added to your toolbox. Uh, I'm glad I learned it, and um, it's one of the workhorses that I use now. So I'm glad I was able to share it with you all. Thank you. Some great cases there.
Manish, you must have a comment or a question. I think you have very impressive cases. You're doing great, Olekos, as I expected from you. Thanks. Um, I think the, the major part of this is that um, these spinal cords are sick, these big deformities, and the correction has to be gentle and gradual. And the technique he's describing, we used to do it without that rod, and that's how Alekos learned it, but I think he's improved on it. Um, Cal talks a little bit about this, and he calls it something else. But um, the idea is not to put the strain on the screw immediate to the vertebral column resection, because they're the ones to pull out. Uh, so if you just compress that there, it's not good. So we used to do it distal, but I think this is even better because you're locking them in and then you're slowly correcting through those rods and you can change them out if they get too beat up. Yeah. I think it's a great technique. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Roland, do you want No, I agree. It's very impressive. One of the things that I'd stress that you really brought out is utilizing the constructs that exist because um, the second you start pulling those out, it becomes a trail of tears because one, you're weakening the fixation interface with the bone that the screws have, and two, like you were mentioning, these are typically fragile patients and taking advantage of the work that's already done for you. And you know, when you have 18 or you know points of fixation proximally and maybe more distally, why not take advantage of that? So yeah. I love that technique. I think it's really well done. Great, thanks. Is a mirror set up? All right, thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot.